same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now verse 4 is kind of what we're going to use as our basis for today's uh, lesson. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So I, I can tell you, at least from my, my personal kind of position uh, when I was in the Army and um, maybe my outlook on the government, in politics, um, to me it didn't matter. Now, I, I don't get me wrong, I believe that participating in government and voting and those kind of things are important. Those are our, our duties, right? Our responsibilities as citizens to our country to be involved. But as a soldier, we are subject to the orders that come from those that are superior to us. President of the United States, who is the Commander-in-Chief, on down to my lowest level supervisor, team leader, whatever, right? That's all I'm really interested in, is following the orders, making sure that I'm doing what I'm told to do. The political aspect of things, and this is, this is a challenge for a lot of soldiers, um, is that, and the reason I think Paul is kind of encouraging Timothy not to look at or not to be as engaged in, that's what he's talking about in verse 4, to, if you're a warring person, right, so if you're a soldier and we're engaged in warfare, we don't want to be entangled up in what's happening in the world or this life around us, right, because it can be a distraction from what we're supposed to be doing. And that's a challenge for a lot of soldiers, right? Is on a personal, you know, from a personal perspective, I may disagree with the political course that our government is on. But I swore an oath to uphold and defend not the political system, we're going to look more at this in a minute, but, at, but the Constitution itself. That's where my allegiance lies, into those foundational documents, the Constitution being primary, and the spirit of that which founded our nation, right, and establishes the rights and privileges of us as citizens. That's where my allegiance, that's where my oath is, not on a political system. And, and I, again, from, a, from just my personal perspective, I, did, I tried my best to separate that and not focus on the political stuff, right? Whether I agreed or disagreed. And there are, there are rules in place for those in uniform when it comes to engaging in certain political activities, right? So a soldier can't go to a political rally in military uniform and get up and participate in some sort of speech, right? That's, that, that's against the rules that govern soldiers' conduct. You can't do that. So we've got to look at where our allegiance is. And what Timothy is being told here is, listen, your focus is on, as a soldier of Jesus Christ, your focus is on doing what you are commanded to do as a soldier. Right? And we established a couple of weeks ago the three general orders for a Christian soldier. Love the Lord thy God, love thy neighbor, and go, right? Go and tell. That's what we're supposed to do. So anything else, and we, last week we looked at Jesus talking about, you know, those that believe on him need to be willing to sacrifice everything, family, money, possessions, for him. And, and he even told us, if you're not willing to do that, then you don't belong to me. So our focus then as Christians, as soldiers, has to be on the command. And I think the challenge then is, just like he told he, his, in Jesus' prayer to the, uh, uh, regarding the, um, his disciples in John chapter 17, where he talks about they are in this world, but not of this world. 
right? So that's our challenge as human beings. We have to reside here, as Christians, I should say, we have to reside here in this life with human government because long time ago people decided they didn't want to be ruled by God they wanted a human form of government right there was some cautions against that Samuel I think it's a uh, matter of fact that was uh, first Samuel chapter 8 right if you want to look at that and go back and take a look at that but so we've got to we've got to make sure that we're focused on the right thing and it's very difficult for us I think when we see our government the leadership in our government going astray I'm like way far astray on a lot of issues a lot of things that we completely disagree with so that I think that's where we as Christians have to find what's the line how far do I go because that's not what I'm really supposed to be doing I and and I think as individuals because the Bible doesn't necessarily give us direction in this, uh, in this regard, but as individuals then we, we need to make decisions on do I go and protest? Should I protest what's happening in our government? Should I go out and, you know, if there's a rally and I want to protest against abortion or, or homosexual rights or, you know, whatever. Pride, you know, Pride Month is over now, okay, ended uh, what two days ago but there was a lot of we talked about that right there was a lot of opposition to that there was a lot of protest on both sides for and against so where do we fit as Christians where do we fit into that yeah go ahead Mike the battle's not against flesh and blood it's spiritual right so you deal with the spiritual aspect of it. prayer a lot of it and I think, so, what we're going to get into is what, what we have to, and, and again, this is not easy, I don't think, because of the, the physical life, the circumstances that we have to live in, right? Because we can't just, we can't just not work. You have to have income. Things aren't free, okay? Okay. <laughs> So you have to have a place to live, you have to have food to eat, you have to have clothing. I mean, there are some things, that basic necessities that we have to have to survive in this earthly environment. So that requires us to get a job or, you know, first off, go to school and learn something. And eventually you get a job so that you can earn some income and support yourself and your family. And eventually someday maybe you can retire and you don't have to work anymore. But you work for what, you know, what you're getting, right, that retirement income. And still things aren't free. You have to pay for them. We know that because we pay a lot of taxes so our government can provide us things, right? So we're in this world, but Jesus said we're not of this world. So the challenge then for us as Christians is where is our allegiance? What is it that we are committed to? So what, what does allegiance mean anyway? When we say allegiance, and again, it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of fitting that we're talking about this because in this morning's service, we're going to pledge allegiance to the flag as part of our, of part of our independence recognition, Independence Day recognition uh, service this morning. But when we say those words, I pledge allegiance to, what does that mean? What are we doing? Okay. Okay. We're committed to our country. Okay. So, a definition that we'll use, and some of some of this is a little older, uh, the the way that it's defined, but it really started off as an obligation of a subject or a servant to his Lord. It goes back to feudal times, right? So the Lord was, that's where we get the root landlord, right? Because the Lord owned the land, and those that resided on that land had an obligation to that Lord, okay? The problem with some of that, though, in those days was 
allegiance that may not have been voluntary. Right? You were forced into allegiance. You had to pledge your allegiance to this landlord, or we could call him the liege lord, was the feudal terminology. And if you didn't, and you didn't obey, and you didn't fulfill your obligations, then there were penalties associated with that. Hopefully it was just something like getting kicked off the land, <laughs> but it could result in taking your property, it could result in death, right? You didn't have a choice. The other part that we'll look at is uh, allegiance, uh, another part of the definition of allegiance is the fidelity owed by a subject or citizen to a sovereign government. So what is owed by the citizens to the government? What do we owe the government? I think in today's society, that's flipped around, right? We don't feel, I say we because I, sometimes I feel this way too, to be honest, right? Because we don't feel that we owe the government anything. I pay taxes, so you need to go, you owe me, <laughs> right? So now we have what we, now today we refer to as this entitlement mentality that has permeated especially a, a, a lot of the younger generation where there's no sense of obligation or no sense of duty to the government. I owe the government nothing. Fidelity means a faithful adherence to an obligation or a duty. Honesty, loyalty, some of the words that you all use, reliability. So what do I owe the government? If we go back and we study the foundational period of our nation, which we're going to talk about this morning. I'm going to share some of that with you this morning in the service. But when we look at what was happening in our country from, let's say, 1774 through 1778, because the war with Great Britain, the Revolutionary War, lasted until 1778. It didn't end technically until Yorktown, right? That's when, when it officially ended. There were some little skirmishes after that, but when Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown, that was the end of, of the main conflict for the revolutionary period. We declared independence, though, July the 4th, 1776. But if you go back and you look at those historical documents and the writings of the men that wrote those documents, and you see what they were writing home I don't want to give up what I'm going to talk about this morning, but when you see what they were writing home from Philadelphia in May, June, and July of 1776 to their family members, they had a very sincere and very obvious sense of obligation to a nation that didn't even exist yet. They were willing to pledge their life, their liberty, and their finances, everything they had for the sake of freedom, right? So there's an obligation that they felt to their nation. Is there an obligation that we have today? Some of us, generations like mine and before, felt an obligation and went to serve in whatever capacity, right? Army, Navy, it could have been that, it could have been civil service, could have been something else, right? But an obligation to give back and serve my country, to be, a pu you know, to be a public servant. Nowadays, we can't get anybody to serve. <laughs> the military is literally, and I just, I, I, I'll throw this in as just something for you to think about, because uh, I've told you before that we, j the Army specifically is failing in its recruiting mission by thousands, not by just a couple, but by thousands, okay? Because there, there is a number that Congress gives to the Department of Defense and says, the United States Army can be comprised of this number on active duty. And it's 400, it used to be 485,000. That was the active duty number. So you couldn't go above that. And several years went by, and we didn't meet the recruiting goals to maintain that 485,000. But now, all of a sudden, we're meeting recruiting goals. Why is that? Because Congress changed the number. Because it's not 485,000 now. Now it's 435,000. 
So they reduce the, the overall strength of the army so that we can show on paper that we're meeting recruiting goals, right? So it's a political trick. But there's no, the point though is we're not meeting those goals because I think there's a lack of sense of responsibility or, or I owe something to my country for the freedoms and the liberties that are provided to me. Instead, again, there's this mentality that you owe me something, right? And, and that's, from a Christian standpoint, that's something we have to be very, very careful about. I don't owe, God doesn't owe me anything. Right? He doesn't owe us anything, but he freely and willingly, without price, gave us a means of salvation. He didn't owe us that. Adam and Eve rejected, right? Sinned and turned away from God. And man has historically done that over and over and over and continuously throughout history since the Garden of Eden. God doesn't owe us anything. If anything, God owes us punishment for failing to obey his, his law, right? But he freely gave. So now, what do I owe him? Everything, exactly, everything. But yet, when we pray sometimes, <laughs> it's like, hey, you know, hey, God, if you, if you do this for me, you know, I, I think you, things have been tough. I think you owe me a good day. <laughs> no. I, I, I mean, I'm not, I, maybe I'm taking it just a tad bit too, too far, but I think we really need to be careful on how we look at our relationship, our, our allegiance to God. Is we, he doesn't owe us anything. We owe him everything, right? We owe him everything because he's given us freely everything. Allegiance also includes an obligation. We talked a little bit about this. Uh, and it's a devotion, loyalty, right? So we have, as a Christian, we have an allegiance to the country that we reside in here on earth. And we have an allegiance to the kingdom of heaven, of which we are citizens at birth, right? Physical birth here, spiritual birth, right? When we are born again, the terminology that we use, when we're born again, we're born as new citizens, joint heirs with Jesus, heirs to everything that he, that he possesses. He calls us his friend, his brother. So now we are part of the kingdom of heaven. So which do we owe the greater allegiance? To God. to God, right, it's pretty obvious, I would think. So I find this interesting. If you are born here in the United States, right? If you're born here in the United States, you are automatically at birth a citizen. There's no requirement for you to swear allegiance to the country because you were born here. The only time that you would take any sort of oath of allegiance would be if you joined the military, you joined some sort of civil service. Civil servants have to swear an allegiance as well, right? But if you are a foreign-born person and you come to the United States through the legal process, right, and you want to become a citizen, we have rules. You have to reside here so, you know, so many years. You can't have a criminal record. You've got to be able to support yourself or have somebody that can support you. And then when you've done all of that, you have to submit this document, goes into the immigration and naturalization service, right? And they'll review that, then they'll call you in for an interview, and you'll have to sit down with a, with a person face to face, and they'll ask you questions. When was the United States founded? Who was the 16th president of the United States? Who was it? Abraham Lincoln, right. So they'll ask you a series of questions like that. And then, once you pass everything and you get accepted, they've done background checks, then they'll hold a citizenship ceremony 
where you appear before a judge, right? We see pictures sometimes in the newspaper or whatever. You'll be, appear before a federal judge. They do them in Harrisburg, right, at the courthouse, the federal courthouse in Harrisburg. So you appear before a judge. The room is usually full, and they all stand there with their hand raised, greatly pleased, or very well pleased, because, you know, we're not prideful people, right? So... <laughs> So they raise their right hand and they swear an oath. So why do they have to do that and I don't? And here's what they swear. I hereby declare, and, and I'm, I'm going to emphasize a couple words, but, but kind of listen to what, uh, what the oath is. This is the oath of allegiance for the United States citizenship. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen. So the beginning of the oath of allegiance is I renounce everything or anybody or anything I was ever subject to before. Now, as I'm reading this, think of this from a Christian perspective, right? That I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, to the Constitution. That I will bear arms. That I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law. The draft is coming. Anyway, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law. That I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law. And that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. So again, why does a foreign born person that wants to become an American citizen have to swear an oath of allegiance renouncing any ties to any other governments that they've ever been subject to and that they're willing to stand up and bear arms or in, in whatever manner they can support the defense of the country. When the citizens, the, those of us that were born here, don't even have to do that. So when, when soldiers join, um, or when, when citizens, or when people, I shouldn't say citizens because they don't have to be, but when, when people come and they want to join the military, do they have to be a citizen? I hear a yes, I see a this one. Which one is it? Huh? Do you have to be a citizen to be a member of the armed force of the United States of America? The answer is no, you do not. You do not. You only have to swear, sorry, you only have to swear allegiance to the Constitution in your oath of enlistment. You can't have a criminal background. You have to be able to read and write and fully understand English. And that's it. Those are the basic requirements. Oh, I'm sorry. You have to be a resident, a, 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 a permanent resident. So in other words, part of that immigration process, right, you can apply for permanent residency, what we call, what we refer to as a green card. It's really not a green card anymore, but they have to be a green card. Which, me, which really that means that they've had background checks and things that have done to validate that they're not a criminal or they're not a terrorist or something like that. That they truly are here to, you know, better their lives or... But that's it. Those are the requirements. You do not have to be a citizen. Now, if you joined, you, there is a fast track process to get to citizenship, but that can't be the main reason why you joined. Okay, and I've served with a lot of guys um, and women, primarily men though, that have joined the military that were not U.S. citizens. I did the same thing when I went in. It was like a jet 
Japanese girl or a Chinese girl. Or a sure. Girl. It was really amazing when you got to know things that you didn't know. <laughs> right. Right. So the oath of enlistment then for the military is I state your name. All right, if everybody would stand, please. And no, okay. I used to have the authority to do that, but I don't anymore. Um, I state your name. Do solemnly swear, or you can affirm, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Again, to the Constitution, not to an individual. And that's what makes the United States so much different than other countries. If you look at what other countries' oath of enlistment might be, is you are pledging your allegiance to a king, a potentate, a ruler, whomever is in charge. So regardless of whether you agree with them, see, I think I would have a problem with that. Right? Because here in America, well, we won't get into that, but here, uh, deeply, but here in America, we have an obligation to our country that if things are going sideways in the government, the people have the right and the responsibility to rise up against a tyrannical government and to start over. That's what our Constitution says, right? That's, that's what we were founded on, is those principles. So what then is our Christian obligation to earthly government? Go to 1 Peter. What is our obligation to our government here? While you're turning there, does anybody have any comments? 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm the second Peter. What do we owe the government? Taxes? <laughs> well, Sam doesn't like that. Like, no. <laughs> oh, no, that's always bad. What do we owe the government as a Christian? All right, well, let's look at First Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through uh, 17. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Wait, let's stop. What does ordinance mean? The law. Only those laws that we agree with. What's the word? Every. See, and this is, this is where... I am convicted and challenged myself when you think about this, right? The Christian then, we are to do what? Submit ourselves so we are to obey, we are to follow every ordinance of man, not for my sake, but for the Lord's sake. So what does that, what do we do? We'll look at this in just a minute, but think about this for a second. So what does that mean then if I disagree? What if I disagree with the ordinance of man? Must be willing to suffer the consequences. Must be willing to suffer the consequences. Let's continue. Okay, so verse 13, uh, second half. Whether it be to the king as supreme, verse 14, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the what? Will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Verse 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and what? Honor the king or the government, right? Whoever's in, in power. So we are to submit ourselves, in verse 13, to every ordinance of man, whether we agree or not. Because that's, our, that's God's will. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to live a life of peacefulness. Right? We're supposed to try to get along with people. We're, because 
Why? Because our mission, and we had this saying, so I've, we've been through this before, I've told you all what I did when I was in the Army, right? And I learned this, like, r really early in my career. When you would bring somebody in that was believed to have committed a crime, a suspect, right, in a crime, and we would sit him down in the chair, there was basically two ways you could go up, go about the interview. One, you could go in there and pound on the table and yell at him and call him all kinds of, you know, criminal and, you know, whatever. Or you could go in there and try to be polite, be nice. And we had the saying, I catch more flies with honey than I do with vinegar. And I think that, and I've tried to apply that principle in life in general. I think when you try to be polite and courteous to people and peaceable, you have a, probably a greater amount of success, not just in an interview or an interrogation, but just in relationship with people. But when you're angry and you're pounding on the, and that's where I think as Christians sometimes we need to be careful on how we present the gospel and how we come across is, and I'm not saying that we don't preach against sin and something, sometimes it's okay, it's not what I'm saying, but when we face some of the things that we face in, in our communities today, just like we were talking about earlier with protesting, if you decide to go protest, if that's something that you want to do, and go stand on the street, you know, or, or hold a picket sign or whatever you choose to do, then we need to be peaceable about it. You can't be holding a sign that says, Jesus loves you, and yelling a bunch of names across the street at the people that you're trying to attract to the gospel. It doesn't work, right? The same thing with violence. We cannot use violence as Christians to try to force people into submission to the message of the gospel. It doesn't work that way. And we look at, the, at our Savior. Jesus never did that. He didn't force people. One of the things that drew people to him was his, was his peaceable nature, right? So we have to be willing to submit to whatever is, is out there for the Lord's sake because it's our testimony. It's our testimony of him and his intent for us. Obviously, it's his will. And if it's God's will, then it's our obligation, some of the words that we use talking about allegiance, if it's God's will that we do that, then it becomes our obligation then to obey and to follow God's will. It's one of those things that we really don't have a choice, to be honest with you. That's the way we should be living. That is the way that we should abide every day, right? And then as servants of God, right? In verse 16, we see as servants of God. So we are his servants. And just because we have an amount of freedom, because we are born again, doesn't mean that we can act out which would cause others to turn away, okay? Uh, Romans chapter 13. Let's go, to, let's go there real quick. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Still talking about what is it that we owe to the government. Romans 1, I'm sorry, 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are ordained, of powers that be, are ordained of God. What does that mean? What's, what's Paul saying in verse 1? What does that mean? Yes. So again, we see, let every soul be subject, right? So again, we are subject to the higher powers. And we have to understand, like just like Liz was saying, we have to understand that those higher powers are there because God allows them to be there. And we know from biblical history, right, if we go back in the Old Testament and we look at those times when Israel was confronted with an enemy, 
God told him up front, listen, I'm preparing this nation that's going to come against you. And typically, it was because they had sinned and he was using them as a means to bring punishment or some sort of retribution against them because of them turning away from him. So we know that God will put people into authority or allow certain governments to exist for purposes that fit into his plan. That's, that's kind of difficult to understand, you know, for us to accept sometimes. Because we've seen some governmental systems in the last, you know, hundred, well, we can go back to the beginning of history, but let's look at just the last hundred years. In some systems of government that we know are dictatorial, right? And if you didn't agree with the dictator in power, there was a ditch out back and that's where you went. Right? That's, that's exactly what happened. Look at what happened in, in Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, under Pol Pot. Look what happened in Nazi Germany in the 40s, 30s and 40s. Right? So for some reason, God allowed those systems to come, those governmental systems, and those that were in, in authority to come into power for a purpose. There was a purpose there. We may or may not understand that purpose. One day, I think when we get to heaven, if you want to know, I don't know that God's going to sit everybody down and, you know, Jesus is going to say, okay, well, let me tell you why this happened. I don't know that he's going to do that. But I would, I would hope, anyway, that if I went and said, hey, Lord, can you tell me why did this have to happen? I'm, I, I think he's going to tell us, right? But there was a purpose, there was a reason why that happened, right? Because God ordained, God allowed this to happen, right? The powers that be are ordained of God. So they are put in place by him. Verse 2, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, what? Resisteth the ordinance of God. So if we resist the authority, we're actually, for all intent and purpose, and in truth, <laughs> we are resisting God himself. Wow. Mm. Yes. Okay, Mike, you're jumping way ahead here now. <laughs> Yes. Why did that happen? To bring honor and glory to God and to be a witness. Yes. To Correct. That, that you can see right away. But uh, as I said, if you're not willing to follow those orders, then it's, it's going to be such a consequence. That's exactly right. And there's, a lot of, there's a lot of Christians in this world that are dying because they refuse to worship believers. So we're, gonna, we're, we're almost there. So we're going to kind of stop where we're at here. I've got some more that we'll talk about. We'll finish this up next week. But, but um, if you look at verse 6, go down and look at verse 6. And this is, you know, now we see the discussion of uh, paying tribute, right? For, for this cause pay ye tribute also that they are God's ministers. See, that's what we have to understand, right? So tribute is taxes. So God is telling us it is our obligation because it's his will, because he ordained the system for us to pay taxes because those that are in authority are supposed to minister unto the people. So God established it. Now, it doesn't always work that way, <laughs> but that's his intent. And those that pervert his intent and, and don't follow will pay the price themselves, right? They'll pay the price for themselves. But, but really, all the takeaway for us as Christians is, don't complain when you write the check to pay off your taxes because that's our duty and responsibility. God has told us we need to do that. We're supposed to obey the laws that are, that are uh, uh, written, legislated in our country, whether we agree with them or not. Now, if we disobey, and we'll start getting into this next week, right? So what do we do when the ordinance of man contradict the, our obligation to God? Is it permissible then for us to refuse to obey? Yes. 
So don't think that Joel's telling you that you have to just do blindly everything the government says. There's a point where you can refuse, but like Mike said, and we'll get into more of this next week, um, and, and I encourage you, I'll throw this plug in um, as we close, I encourage you to come out on Sun, not, not this Sun, not tonight, but on Sunday evenings, the pastor's going through Daniel, because we're going to go to Daniel, and there are some very clear examples of resistance and opposition to the laws and the regulations that were put in place by a government that was selfish, right, to say the least. Okay, so there is a time when we can do that, when we can refuse. We just need to be prepared to face the consequences for doing so, right? And I think that's what, and think of, kind of, uh, you know, meditate on this until next Sunday. I wish we could do, like, do this every day, you know, and we just keep it going. Because uh, until next Sunday, it's too, too long, too far down the road. Um, but we've got to think from a Christian perspective and, and, and you know, um, kind of meditate on this, if you will. Is If my obligation is to God and the ordinance of man are in opposition to God's divine will and intent, and I choose to disobey the laws of man, am I really willing to accept the consequences that go with that? I mean, we, we'll, in this environment, we'll shake our heads, we'll say, amen, brother, yes, that's right, I will. But when you're faced with it, and we've talked a little bit about this, and this is, this is a legitimate concern that I have, as our country continues to progress for, farther and farther away from God, and Jesus clearly told us, in the last days they will hate you, they will persecute you, and they will kill you. So what happens when the laws change and our Bible now becomes a symbol of extremism and hate and is forbidden? And we say, well, that will never happen. It's happened in our world in the last hundred years. And when they say, if you have a copy of this, or if you don't give it up to be burned like everything else, then you face the firing squad, or you face loss of your money, or you're going to lose your job, or this is, you know, whatever the penalty might be. Are we really willing to take a stand to that point, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did? We are not going to bow and pray to that king and if you want to put me in the fiery furnace I'm going to sing praises to the one that will save me who I trust will save me right, right. and if it meant their lives they were willing to give up their lives are we willing to do that and we'll talk some more about this next week so just keep that in your mind